Thank you very much indeed. Well, from uh, one of our publicly owned broadcasters to our other main publicly owned broadcaster, Channel 4. Particularly pleased to have Dan Brook from uh, Channel 4 uh, leading off the discussion here uh, with a distinguished panel, but also particularly pleased to welcome our president, Dame Colette Bowe, who is going to chair this session. So it's over to you, Colette. Thank you very much, Colin. And um, uh, wasn't that a cracking start to our day? I thought that talk by Tony Hall was top notch. And we could have obviously gone on responding to it for hours. But let's now, as Colin says, move on to our other great publicly owned broadcaster um, in the form of Channel 4. Now, we all have quite a few questions in our mind, I think, about Channel 4. One is, is the present model sustainable? Question mark. Um, if we think it isn't, why might we think that? Second, what about the remit of Channel 4? Has the model we've got, is that the right model for sustaining the ambitious remit of Channel 4? Do we think Channel 4's fulfilling its remit? Question. And then perhaps most interesting of all, are there other models for Channel 4's ownership or how it is run that might enable it to play an even more salient role than it already does in our public service broadcasting landscape? So there's obviously enough things here to keep us talking till this time tomorrow, but we're not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to ask Dan Brook from Channel 4 to kick us off with, Dan, if you would like to give us your take on how are things at Channel 4. Then I'm going to ask uh, Maggie Brown, who we all know, and who, by the way, is following up her first volume of History of Channel 4 with a second volume, which is going to contain even more enticing revelations, I hope, Maggie. And then I'm also delighted to welcome to the platform a great friend of the VLV, Steve Morrison, a very experienced broadcaster, as we all know, who is also going to comment. Then we'll throw it open to the floor. Um, and I know from this audience there will be a large number of extremely interesting questions. So, Dan, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stand up here so that I can see everybody. Um, I, I'm, I'm also uh, I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit about the Channel 4 model, uh, about how we're doing, and about our view of some of the questions that have been asked about the future. The first thing I want to cover is why we do all this. And effectively, there's two parts to that. So there's the remit, and then there's the business model the innovative hybrid business model that we have to deliver the remit. So remit, as you know, is given to us by Parliament to do a whole wide variety of things, but at the centre of that are innovation, championing alternative points of view, championing young people, championing new talent, and championing diversity. And the, the model that we have to do that, uh, as I'm sure you know, is we're publicly owned, public service broadcaster, uh, but we're advertiser, we're commercially funded, largely advertising, and always have been. We don't take a penny of taxpayers' money. Um, but we're also a non-profit, so all of the revenues that we generate from the market go back into uh, making programmes. And the vast majority of our programmes are made by British producers. Uh, we are the only publisher broadcaster uh, or officially designated publisher broadcaster in the UK. So we, c we have no in-house production. We commission from uh, about 300 SMEs up and down the country uh, and support about 17,000 jobs in the indie sector. And the way that we operate that model is what we call a cr uh, our Robin Hood cross-funding model. So the most public service of our activities generally lose money. Channel 4 News, take that as an example, occupies more airtime than any other programme on Channel 4, loses quite a lot of money. That's paid for by other programmes that make money. So if you ever wonder to yourself why there are a lot of episodes of Come Dine With Me and Location Location on Channel 4, it's because they pay for Channel 4 News. And it's an absolutely brilliant model, this, and, and, an innov and, and innovative one. So it's rooted in the market, but rather than pay financial returns to shareholders, effectively, us, the public, get a social and a cultural dividend from delivering the remit. Um, when Channel 4 was invented, there was nothing really like that model, in, just in general in business. Uh, now, there's a word for it. People call it a social enterprise. And in effect, Channel 4 is the largest social enterprise in the country. 
So how has this model been working? Well, we believe that creatively and commercially, it's been working almost better than it has done for many, many years. Uh, I'm going to, if I may, just sort of list out uh, uh, some of the accolades that we've received uh, in the last two or three years. So as you saw on the tape, we've been made Channel of the Year by the Edinburgh Festival, also made Channel of the Year by Broadcast Magazine. Last week, we were made Brand of the Year by the Marketing Society. That's the first time we've ever won that award. In the summer, we were made Britain's Best Diverse Company at the National Diversity Awards. Last year, Campaign Magazine made us Advertiser of the Year and Medium of the Year. Uh, and over the last three years, we've won 22 BAFTAs and seven Oscars. So I don't think that that is too shabby certainly by a judge, as it were, by peer recognition. Ratings on Channel 4 were up last year. That's the first time that's happened for many, many years. And this year, they're holding. Last year, our revenues were the highest they've ever been. Our programming spend on UK programs was the highest it's ever been. Now, the greatest success, though, as you, as you can see, is in the programs. I do want to just draw out one programmer in a bit more detail, which is the Paralympic Games. Um, Jeremy Isaacs, who many of you know, um, kindly said that he thought that London 2012 was Channel 4's finest hour. And, uh, you know, I would say Jeremy is not known for complimenting his successes. Um, but, but, but we believe... Jer I haven't had Jeremy's opinion on what happened, uh, what we did in Rio, but we believe that Rio was better than London. Why do we believe Rio was better than London? Because we think that we saw more change in the world as a result of what we did. Let me give you some examples of that. So when we went to Rio, 65% of our on-screen presenting talent were disabled. That was 50% in, in London. When we, uh, when we, after being there for a couple, two or three days in Rio, the organizers said, do you know, in London, when we went around the studios of all the international broadcasters, there was only one that had a disabled person in it, and that was Channel 4's. We've just done the same exercise here in Rio, and every single studio has a disabled person in it. I mean, it was extraordinary. It was literally like seeing the world change in front of your eyes. We've also seen change in the production community. So 15% of, uh, of our production staff for Rio this, this, uh, this year were disabled. We didn't even measure that in London. 50%, 15% is a high number. We trained 24 young people to, over a course of a year, uh, put them into indies and, and, and other broadcasters to train them uh, for, for Rio. I spent some time with them just before they went out for the games and I said, have you learned a lot from the companies that you've been working in? And they said the most magical thing. They said, yes, we've been learning a lot, but guess what? The companies that we've been working with have been learning a lot from us, have been learning it, what, what it's like to work with a disabled person and to make adjustments. Um, we have seen a uh, change in public attitudes. So the Yes I Can advert that we produced, we have been received, we've been inundated with letters uh, from teachers throughout the UK who have been saying they've been using that advert to teach kids in their school about uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, just after the games, we got a call from the exam board of Great Britain. Our initial response to their call was, we think you may have the wrong number. Uh, but they said, no, we have got the right number. We're just telling you that as of next year, we are going to include your Paralympics marketing and coverage as part of the national curriculum for media studies at A-level and GCSE. And as a parent, uh, you know, I can think of no higher honour than that. Um, I think we've changed sports broadcasting too. So the way that the last leg blended uh, comedy and entertainment and sport in prime time uh, was revolutionary. And we also changed the advertising industry. We held a competition gave to give away a million pounds worth of, uh, of our airtime to the advertiser that came up with a campaign that best featured disabled people. Uh, that was won by Maltesers. Uh, they said it's one of the most successful, commercially one of the most successful campaigns that they've ever produced. They had three ads, all had disabled people in it. So amazing message, disability sells. Uh, and more than that, diversity sells. Um, so, uh, and I'm pleased that we, Channel 4, are back in a leadership position on diversity. Uh, I mentioned the award that we have received. We've got our five-year 360-degree diversity charter. I don't have de uh, a time, unfortunately, to go into more detail on that, but I'm personally thrilled about the results that we have achieved as I'm the board champion for, for diversity. Uh, and all of this is producing uh, fantastic commercial results. I, I said what are, what's happening to our revenues uh, last year. 
the, the growth that we're seeing in our digital revenues has been very, very strong. Uh, a lot of that has been driven by this innovative data strategy, which we've now had in the market for some time, which allows us to provide more targeted advertising for advertisers uh, online. We've launched our indie growth fund. We've launched an innovative commercial growth fund whereby consumer-facing brands who want to advertise on television, uh, we will give them airtime in return for equity uh, or revenue shares in their business. Uh, and we've launched Walter Presents, uh, which is a, a way of bringing more foreign language drama to UK audiences online. So, uh, honestly, I mean, I would say this, but honestly, I'm not sure that we could actually be doing much better with the homework that we're given and the model that we're given to do it with at the moment. So we are, I, I am bound to say, perplexed as to why the government has continually been asked, uh, asking about the sustainability of the organisation. <laughs> we believe that we are sustainable, uh, but you shouldn't take my word for it. There are not one, not two, not three, not four, not, but five respected external bodies. Uh, I've got the reports that they've written here. Uh, you know, they're not insubstantial, uh, who have come out and agreed with us. Uh, so that's Ofcom, that is EY, that's uh, Enders Analysis, that is the Lord's Communications Committee, and it's Paddy Barwise of the London Business School. And they've all crunched the numbers and come to the, broadly the same conclusion, which is that Channel 4 is sustainable with its current model over the next five to ten years. We are also, quite honestly, puzzled about why the government is still considering all of the options for Channel 4, including privatisation. We have repeatedly said, uh, both privately and publicly, that we think that this special cultural and social dividend that we deliver via our remit uh, would be very significantly, is of great value and would be very significantly at risk. Um, but again, you shouldn't just take our word for it. More or less all of the major constituencies within the industry, of which I put viewers uh, at the forefront, but also produ producers, advertisers, competitors, the diversity lobby, a number of other charitable sectors have all said the same thing. Don't privatise Channel 4 because the special thing that it delivers will be lost. Um, so that leads me finally to where we are in the process. Um, I mean, the short answer is we are still in limbo. Um, we are in discussions with the government. I know you will want me to tell you all of the detail of that. I'm not going to be able to, unfortunately. Um, but what I can say is that we're, we're encouraged by the things that the government have publicly have said about their support for public service, the public service broadcasting system, about Channel 4's role, about the performance that we are, uh, are sort of having within uh, all of that. We're also... You know, we're, we, uh, we appreciate that, the, that the, we think the government appreciates the need now to get on with this and to give our organisation certainty because it is worth remembering that this process of the government review has now been underway for 14 months, uh, you know, which is quite a long time. Um, however, this government, uh, certainly in some respects, has uh, established a very good reputation for itself uh, with decisiveness uh, around power stations, around uh, airports, <laughs> and uh, we remain hopeful. Trains. Uh, trains. We remain hopeful that they will not want to uh, alter this. Uh, they will want to maintain this uh, reputation in the field of broadcasting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan.